As John said, my name is Alex Orleans. I'm from the cyber physical team at FireEye, uh, and I'm here today to talk about uh, Russian espionage targeting the U.S. electrical grid. Before we get started, a little disclaimer that I have to read word for word. Our analysis of specific Russian persons and organizations is based entirely on analysis of open source reporting. Uh, and analysis based on FireEye collection is limited to of abuses of computer systems, tactics involved, and operator motives. With that out of the way. A little bit about me and Chris. Uh, Chris could not be here. Uh, from my understanding, what Chris is doing right now is he is learning how to survive a helicopter crash landing at sea. So is he having more fun or is he having less fun? Who knows? Uh, so Chris, as John said, is a principal consultant at Mandian in their ICS practice. He has over a decade of experience uh, specializing in slides. Uh, <laughs> specializing in uh, transmission and distribution SCADA systems for the electrical grid. Uh, the first half of this talk was intended to be him. I will do my best to do justice to his work. Uh, my speciality on the cyber physical team is uh, matters related to the Russian intelligence community, with a particular emphasis given my posting on espionage that targets critical infrastructure uh, around the world. So what are we here to talk about today? Uh, bears in the wires. We're here to talk about the fact that there is a, still a concentrated Russian cyber espionage campaign targeting the uh, bulk of the US electrical grid. But the fact that those targets are relatively hardened compares to, compared to others, why does it continue to see Russian targeting? That really boils down to is four things. One, we're going to talk about kind of an emblematic threat, temp isotope, which is the main uh, espionage actor with a Russian nexus that we've seen targeting the U.S. electricity sector. Two, the structure, history, and kind of the resilience of the grid, as well as the grid's history in relation to cyber threats. Uh, why the Russians don't care? Um, from the perspective of how they conceptualize and execute intelligence operations and what that means to them and why, because of that, they're unlikely to stop targeting these entities anytime soon. And finally, a couple of thoughts on what we can do with that. Temp Isotope is a Russian nexus espionage actor that FireEye has been tracking, or at least seen active since around 2015. Uh, they're active particularly in North America, Western Europe, and the Middle East. Uh, they're tracked by a wide variety of names throughout the industry. The one that I most see associated with them is Dragonfly 2.0 and Berserk Bear. Uh, the US and UK governments have attributed activity that FireEye believes is Temp Isotope to Russian government cyber operators. So we have pretty solid attributive connection on that side. Uh, and in the press, uh, U.S. officials have stated to the Washington Post that that same set of activity, uh, off, they said in anonymous sources in the U.S. government, attributed isotope to the FSB, uh, the Russian Federal Security Service. And we're going to get back to them in a little bit. But keep in mind that the second half of this talk uh, kind of takes that concept and says, let's assume that that's a reasonable attributive statement for that individual to make, although FireEye is not saying that. So the basic modus operandi is uh, a lot of rinse and repeat TTPs, tactics, uh, and tools. The idea is using themed watering holes and spear fishes, especially targeting critical infrastructure verticals in electricity, oil, natural gas. Uh, it's a living off the land tool set for the most part, although they do have one unique backdoor that we've been able to kind of focus as being an isotope related tool. Um, they have two kind of pet tactics. Uh, one is they look for ICS data stored on corporate networks rather than trying to get all the way to an OT or an ICS facing network uh, in order to lower the pain point that they have to go through to get their data, as well as using uh, compromised third parties, supply chain entities, contractors, affiliated groups in order to reach their actual more hardened targets like large utilities. Um, because they've been able to maintain such a significant op tempo for the last couple of years, although we haven't seen them very recently. Um, they get a lot of high profile reporting for their activities, which is something else I'm going to discuss a little bit later. So now that we've talked about the threat, let's talk about the target. Uh, in this case, we're talking about the electrical grid, which Chris would say it's really a quilt. Um, he describes it as the most complex quilt that human beings as a species have been able to put together so far. It's actually five grids managed and overseen by two governments consisting of 3,000 or so entities, not counting all the regulatory and individual government agencies that are involved. Uh, and what it boils down to is three basic functions, generation, transmission, and distribution. So at the operational level, the quilt boils down to these three functions. You have generation through things like hydroelectric power ranging to nuclear power. Transmission, where that electricity is then spun up to a high enough voltage that it can be carried long distances without loss of sufficient load, which is then dialed down to distribution systems 
that can then give things, give electricity to customers. Um, I want to keep things simple because I'm going to, otherwise I'd be referring to those three things all the time. Basically, generation and transmission make up what is called the bulk electric system. Uh, this is what the average person thinks of when you think of the electrical grid. You're thinking of the infrastructure that supports generation and transmission. These are large utilities, generation entities, um, many, and some of the transmission entities actually have distri distribution sub-entities, but we'll get to that. Uh, but that's called the bulk electric system. So when you hear me say bulk electric system or BES, I'm talking about generation and transmission. These are the harder targets. These are the focus of what I'm trying to get at here. There's also distribution entities. These are the vast majority of those 3,000 entities. These are about 2,500 to about 500. Um, and these are the uh, really customer-facing entities and utilities, cooperatives, municipal power. This is who gives the power to the customers from transmission entities. Uh, they're smaller. Uh, they're usually not as well resourced, not as well funded, but it's kind of an uneven landscape in that sense. So when we're talking about the grid, we have a couple of key incidents in history to give us a sense of what the threat landscape looks like. The big thing that kicked off cyber concerns about the grid was the 2003 blackout that left 50 million people without power in the Northeast. Um, it was actually this incident that then was the first one where people were concerned may or may not have been a cyber angle involved in leading to the blackout because Blaster had appeared three days before the blackout on August 11th, and then the blackout took place on August 14th. So when after action analysis was being done, there was a lot of concern, oh, could Blaster or some other worm have been involved? It wasn't, but it did kind of raise the visibility of the concern of cyber threats to critical infrastructure in that sense. Fast forward to 2008, Tom Donahue, then the top uh, CIA analyst for cyber issues, says at Sands in New Orleans that CIA has observed foreign utilities getting hacked, being subjected to ransom demands over hacked infrastructure, and that hackers have even uh, been able to turn off power to specific cities. This was a pretty extraordinary disclosure. It got conflated with other reporting for a while where people claimed to have known what the country was. We still don't actually know what the country in question was. But uh, it was extraordinary in that CIA normally doesn't talk about things like this. They normally don't make public disclosures like this. So that emphasized you know, how severe they must have seen the threat as from their perspective. Uh, then fast forward to what Chris calls the day everything changed, December 23rd, 2015, when Sandworm used Black Energy 3 and Kill Disk to take out multiple distribution entities in Ukraine, shutting off power for 230,000 people. Very sophisticated incident, as I'm sure all of us are aware, involving live interactive commands from the attackers, clearly supported by a lot of logistics and planning on the front end. Then the next year, about a year later, I think just shy of a couple of days of a year, uh, in Destroyer, again, Sandworm, hitting Kiev this time, rather than focusing on distribution, they hit transmission with in Destroyer, the first malware dedicated to attacking electrical grids. Um, then in 2017, there was what's now referred to as the Nuclear 17 incident, which was a Russian Nexus spear phishing campaign targeting a wide variety of people within critical infrastructure, but disproportionately and in the media most scarily targeting nuclear power engineers. Uh, and then we have Temp Isotope, DHS US CERT threat alert 18074A, where so isotopes activities over several years were attributed to Russian state cyber actors in conjunction with uh, another report from the UK National Security, uh, National Cyber Security Center, again indicating that isotope attributed activities had been targeting critical infrastructure in the UK as well. So we've talked about the threat. Now, what's the defense? Well, it boils down to the acronym NERC-SIP, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation's Critical Infrastructure Protection Standard. Not going to say that again, um, because it's easier to say NERC-SIP. Now, NERC is the main regulatory and standards agency that governs all entities involved in the grid in North America. And the SIP standards, which were put in place and kind of designed following the 2003 Northeast blackout, uh, to harden and make the grid more resilient, particularly the bulk electric system, those generation and transmission entities I was talking about earlier. Um, those entities, large utilities, BES entities, they are required to be NERC-SIP compliant. If they fail in compliance, they face very hefty fines. 
So what you see is a set of safety rules. As Chris says, safety rules are written in blood. NERC SIP standards are written in darkness. Things like the Northeast blackout, things like in Destroyer, things like the sandworm attack in 2014, those are all taken into account into how these standards are designed. Uh, the cybersecurity standard, for instance, emphasizes things like two-factor authentication, network segmentation, whitelisting, and uh, very strict control uh, related to where sensitive data resides on both owned networks and third-party networks. Uh, in fact, it was those standards that a utility uh, earlier this year was fined $2.7 million because they had failed to properly secure sensitive information about, uh, I believe it was transmission operations stored on a contractor's server. Problem is, NERC is not NERCSIP is not for everybody. Not everybody can afford to do it, and not everyone is legally required to be compliant. Um, the large entities are. Smaller ones, particularly those distribution entities I alluded to earlier, are not required, and they often are not resourced. I'm talking about, you know, some town in Iowa that has one guy doing IT and cybersecurity for his entire company, which means occasionally updating his antivirus. Um, but at the same time, some distribution entities that aren't required to be NERC SIP compliant actually go above and beyond the SIP standards. So you have an uneven target landscape when it comes to that 2,500 or so distribution entities. Um, but at the end of the day, and this is you know, really the point that I think Chris and I built towards here, is that NERC SIP compliance really hardens BES entities significantly. It raises the cyber pain point threshold for good effect on target for both espionage and potential attack operations that while you know, no one is immune, they're certainly significantly harder to target in that sense. But they continue to see Russian targeting, which brings me to my first question, uh, which Hugo Weaving put much better than I can. Um, and to answer this question, let's return to the fact that earlier I said people in the US government in press reports in 2017 attributed isotope-related activity to Russia's FSB, the Federal Security Service. Again, let's say, for the sake of argument that that's true. So you have the FSB, the main intelligence service of the Russian Federation, very significant cyber components uh, tied to multiple actors, Isotope, Turla, 29, uh, very, very sophisticated with a lot of resources behind them and very close to the Kremlin. The way that they approach these operations is through something called uh, the Czechist mentality. Czechism dates back to the Cheka of 1917, founded by Felix Zerzhinsky, pictured here as the scumbag that he was. Um, it boils down into three major components within the services today. You have a clandestine mentality uh, elucidated by former CIA Soviet Division Chief Harry Rosinsky, uh, who from his time working uh, on the Russian target, saw a lot of overlap in the ability for them to think and act in secret with a conspiratorial worldview that someone was out to get them, therefore they needed to engage in secret counteraction. Uh, then you have a wartime mindset elucidated by researcher Mark Galliotti. This has kind of been prevalent within the Russian intelligence community since 2015, uh, 2011, pardon me. Focuses on an existential threat from the West, zero-sum competition between Russia and the rest, with an imperative that in this competition, if you are not taking action, you are failing. Therefore, inaction is devalued. So significantly, the emphasis is on action regardless of consequence, like, say, failing to kill someone with a nerve agent in the United Kingdom. Um, and then finally, uh, Jason Kitchen, a former US intelligence officer who's actually in the audience somewhere, um, elucidated of something called hang on tight thinking. This is the idea that you have individual line operators who are trying to get from one day to the next while faced with this aggressive op tempo demand from leadership and uh, from leadership both within their organizations and within the Kremlin. And that tension can lead to instability in operations. So the FSB with this Czechist mindset can actually reap multiple dividends from the perspective of the isotope style activities. They extend to intelligence collection, counterintelligence, active measures, and interagency competition. Intelligence collection is obviously the most blatant one here. You're fulfilling intelligence requirements through operations, both strategic, such as political and economic intelligence, uh, supporting Russia's interest in the global energy sector, in competition for Russian energy, but also you know, industrial espionage to support critical infrastructure improvement programs. But then more sinisterly, you have the concerns about, is this reconnaissance for an attack? Um, are these activities designed to provide gateways that could involve preparation of the environment through leaving implants behind or deploying malware for future use, as well as informing tool development for future attacks? 
Counterintelligence, this is my personal favorite. Um, I, have a, I have a big passion for this. So all of this threat activity you see from actors like Isotope requires defensive responses from incident responders and threat intelligence within a given organization all the way up potentially through government. So you have a ripple upward and outward effect where an intrusion in one utility could suddenly see the U.S. government and all proximate entities or related entities involved having to take steps to deal with the threat, understand the threat. Uh, and this fills counterintelligence's core purpose, which is frustrating your adversary. We are the adversary in this case. Utilities are the adversary for actors like Isotope. So wearing us down through activity, creating anxiety, uh, fulfills what is in counterintelligence terminology known as degradation. Um, and this exploitable anxiety uh, creates other unique opportunities, particularly related to things like active measures. Uh, just to be clear, when I say active measures, that's the Russian term for covert action, which includes everything from killing people deniably to influence operations to strategic deception. It's a broad definition. But here I want to focus on influence operations. Russian influence operations prefer to aim to spread ambiguity, discord, uncertainty, fear, doubt. And being able to take anxiety over, oh no, what happened to the grid? Oh no, hundreds of control rooms were compromised by Russian intelligence. That feeds into other operations. I haven't seen operations specifically meant to exploit grid-related activity, but it certainly feeds into the broader Russian theme of trying to undermine the idea that public and private institutions in the West can protect the general public. That was a big thing related to sandworm. It's clearly a collateral effect that can be used here by isotope. When this stuff comes up, uh, it can exploit a, three overlapping dynamics within the U.S. information environment. One, the U.S. public does not really understand how the grid works or what a threat to the grid really accounts to in the real world. Second, you have, uh, there's very poor communication kind of generally uh, to non-specialist audiences from uh, responsible entities, both utilities and government, about what a threat was, what a threat means, how the threat actually is going to potentially impact operations. And then in the middle, you have the media, where you have an uninformed audience and a poorly communicating source. So how are you going to translate that into something approximating the truth? So that supports a lot of things like misinterpretation that can then amplify future activities. This case in particular turned out to be one wind generator compromised at the control level. And the initial story got lots of play. The correction did not. On the interagency competition level in Russia, being able to deliver significant intelligence dividends wins you a lot of points with the Kremlin, can give you prestige, money, authority. It gives you a lot, and so there's a secondary level incentive for this kind of activity. So I just saw the uh, it's time to wrap it up sign, so I'm going to stop a little bit short. But the idea is all of these dividends are just from targeting the hardened bulk electric system targets. Now imagine if these things were engaged against distribution targets. The amplified effects get higher and higher. The potential dividends get bigger and bigger for the same amount of investment against weaker targets. Um, especially given that distribution targets would likely be where something like a disruptive attack would try to take place. Um, however, I personally don't see a disruptive attack coming from Russia anytime soon because it would mess with their risk calculus. Their goal is death by a thousand cuts, create ambiguity, exploit that ambiguity. Flicking the lights on and off in Des Moines is not ambiguous. That's something that can be rallied around as a messaging against Russia to emphasize the threat. Um, so at that point, I had a number of uh, suggestions about remediation. You can ask me questions about those, but I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you.